So if you're using our um, backstop liquid applied air barrier and you're adhering foam to that wall and then of course the brick and so on, in addition to it being in combination with an EVES project, that entire wall is warranted material and labor by Drive It. So what New Brick offers, we offer standard and custom colors. We have multiple textures, very, very similar to conventional brick. Uh, we have shapes. We can give you special effects. And again, it could be installed directly over our EVE systems, or it could be direct applied. I think uh, so far we've done just about all four applications, or four of the six applications that I'm going to be showing you. OK. So basically what we do is we give you an insulated, high quality performance, which brick does not give you. Of course, brick has to have a cavity and has to have insulation within that wall. Okay. The actual brick itself is with extruded polystyrene, which is our XPS board. A lot of people ask, what is the R value of the brick? The brick itself is an R1.4. It's approximately one and one eighth of an inch thick. And it's adding R point, uh, it should be R1.14 to your overall insulation system. So we were just talking a little while ago, I've spoken with a few people. If you are using it with a conventional EVE system, depending on what your bad insulation is, as long as uh, is in combination with the foam outside of the wall, that will give you your total R value, which we're going to get into. New brick could also be installed by anybody, okay? Uh, a lot of times uh, when I introduce a product like this to uh, masons, masons really don't like this type of a product because they basically feel it's infringing upon their industry. Whereas when I introduce this to EVES applicators, okay, basically what we've done is we've increased the amount of work that you could be bidding on. Uh, typically, when I did a little bit of research, I have found that on approximately 40% of all EVES jobs, there's some type of masonry. So every time you go to one of those EVES jobs, if you see brick and you're bidding the EVES, you can now offer your contractor, your developer, your owner, the combination of a brick wall with the EVES single source, one warranty. Okay, so one trade, one manufacturer, one warranty. We were getting into the different options. What you're looking at up there is, I'm sure if anybody here is a drive it applicator, you all know what Outsolation Plus MD is. We can install this over our Outsolation Plus MD system, Outsolation X, and our cement board MD. These are all Outsolation systems which give you a liquid applied air barrier, give you your R value, it gives you everything soup to nuts. The cement board, is something that has really come up in a lot of ways. People have asked us, can you do a cement board system? We offer it. We have a, C, a cement board MD system, which is a drainage system. That system does not offer insulation. Okay, that insulation would have to be within the studs. So basically, a cement board would be your answer if you were going up against a structural steel panel thin brick system. Okay, typically, those systems drain. They don't really offer CI. They can at a greater price. So that would be our answer to that. If you want to go direct applied over CMU, you can go direct applied over CMU. We have two options. We could add the backstop, or you could do it without the backstop. Typically, if you're adding backstop, okay, that's because there's water penetration issues. There might or might not be water penetration issues if it's new construction. Uh, we're giving you both options. Absolutely. <laughs> The question was, uh, the architect is always going to want the backstop, okay? So basically, you're adding the backstop, and to, to install the backstop over a CMU, it's typical to doing it with any conventional, okay, EVE system. You should really make sure that those joints are either flush, okay, or you're going to have to skim coat it with Genesis, and then you can go and add the backstop, and then you can direct apply the brick. Um, this job you're looking at right here actually is in Connecticut. This was one of my first jobs, actually. It was done by Mark Topham, who's here. He's one of our driver reps. This job was a tilt-up job, and it was supposed to be conventional masonry. The problem is, when the panels got to the job, they didn't have any wall ties. They left the wall ties out. So basically, they could not install the brick. So we gave them a solution 
to install our product over it, saving them pretty much thousands of dollars. They absolutely loved it. It's a gorgeous job. Um, the only thing we always say, if you're using a direct applied over tilt up, you got to make sure you prime that wall because if it's a tilt up wall, there's going to be conditioners in the foam, okay, in the form I should say, to release the actual precast panel. So you got to make sure you detergent wash that wall, okay, and then you have to condition it with prime it. That enhances, okay, your adhesion. Um, ICF is very, very big right now. There's uh, many manufacturers out there in New York that are supplying ICF with a lot of developers. There's a lot of high energy jobs that are going up. There's a lot of passive house jobs going up. You're going to see quite a bit of passive house jobs coming up. So this is one option to a passive house. What's nice about this is when you get that insulated concrete foam, okay, form, and it's installed, okay, you have to be very careful because some of those forms, they do have a tendency of buckling. But by adding a Genesis base coat and mesh on the outside of that ICF, you can install the new brick right over it. This has really, really, really taken off. So keep an eye on masonry projects with ICF because, again, what's happening with this is you're eliminating all of the hung lintels and relieving angles. Now, I'm not going to get into prefabricated lightweight panels because you guys don't do that, and that's your competition, so I'll leave that alone. Okay, but if you were, you could easily install this product over a lightweight panel, steel stud panel. Oops, let me see what guys. All right, so brick masonry 101. How many guys in here have installed masonry? All right, there's a few. All right, everything when it comes to masonry is basically coursing and laying out your job. So you really kind of got to know what you're doing. You got to know what your bond is. You got to know what kind of coursing you have. You got to know what the size of the brick is. Up here, you see up there, that's a, a stretcher bond, okay, or a half bond, running bond. You have an English bond, which actually has one header center of the actual brick. Um, what an English bond used to be is in the old days, they didn't have wall ties. So you'd have an eight inch wall. What they used to do is turn the brick in and have two layers of brick back to back. That one brick would tie the wall together. Okay, but we can give you that effect. Flemish bond is the same thing more or less as an English bond except it's staggered. You have to know the dimensions and the terminology of your brick. Okay, for instance, if you look to the right, you have your stretcher course, you have a soldier, you have a header, a rowlock, sailor, and a rowlock. These are all things you're going to be challenged with as you're bidding these jobs. Okay, so you really have to know, okay, where the architect is designing these patterns. All right. Um, brick are typically laid in modules of 4-8. I always say a 4-8-12. So if you're going horizontally left to right, you always got to keep yourself on a 4-inch. So you're measuring 4-inch, 8-inch, 12-inch, 16. That's the way your coursing is going to lay out. Okay, you should always course out your project, okay, before you lay that first brick, all right? Um, one thing I am going to tell you, because this brick is one inch thick, a lot of times what guys do is they measure it out based on a 4 8 12. You got to remember, where a typical brick is being laid outside of the CMU, it will end with a 4 inch overhanging that CMU or that framed wall by four inches, and then they're turning the next brick over and returning. Because this is one inch, you gotta make an adjustment. It's a three inch adjustment. So when you're measuring it off, okay, remember you only got one inch that you're ending with, then it's returning. That's why you have to course out your job, lay it out. Now typically, if this is a specified project, Okay, from the architect's standpoint, the architect is going to basically course it out. So all you got to do is look at the plans, okay, and it's going to be coursed out. But if you're switching it from a conventional job, you got to make sure you allow that adjustment. Because if not, what's going to happen is if they lay it out to the module I just told you, and you get to that window, you're going to be one inch or three inch off. So you got to accommodate that one inch. Okay, so. For all intent purposes, we make four sizes of brick. We can make any size we want. Okay, so you're looking at a modular brick, Norman brick, Econo brick, utility brick. So because that's what we produce as a standard item, I'm showing you what the coursing is. 
All right, so for instance, if you have an eight inch brick, okay, it basically takes three courses. If you wanted to turn a soldier, which means that brick goes straight up, three brick will equal eight. That's where your coursing is gonna be on your heights, okay? However, the brick is eight inches, modular would be seven and five eighths, plus the mortar joint, three eighths, gives you your eight inches. So always remember, even though the brick might be seven and five eighths or 11 and five eighths long, you're accommodating a three eight inch mortar joint. So seven and five eighths becomes eight inches. 11 and 5 eighths becomes 12 inches. Again, you're on that 4, 8, 12 module. The return is 3 and 5 eighths, plus 3 eighths is 4 inches. So on your horizontals, you're always working on your 4, 8, 12 modules. You only have to lay out for your heights. If it was a economy brick or a utility brick, okay, your, the brick is 4 inches. It's 3 and 5 eighths, plus the mortar joint, which is four inches. That's the easiest brick to lay out because your height is a 4 8 12 and your length is a 4 8 12. Whereas if it was a modular size brick, remember, you're working on an eight now, okay, because three brick equal an eight. So sizes. Right now we offer standard sizes. What you're looking at up there, if I can get this proper, Right there, that's our typical brick. I'm sure everybody walked around and saw our stretcher. A flat brick is called a stretcher. The stretcher actually has a pre-grooved spacer in there, which is three eighths of an inch to allow for that mortar joint. So when your team is actually laying the brick in the wall, other than laying out the first course, as they're laying their brick, you already have your three eight inch mortar joint. Okay, now that doesn't mean you can go all the way up the wall without adjusting it. You're probably still gonna have to adjust it, but that gives you speed from having to worry about lining it up in the wall. Um, as far as our end brick and our corner brick, the question has come up, why don't you have the lip? The reason is, is because of the way it's extruded. Whereas we extrude a stretcher elongated comes out of the extruder like that. In order to get the finish on the corner brick, it comes out of the extruder like that. So what happens is, as you're seeing Eric install the brick as we speak, we put spaces in there. So you'll go out, you'll get yourself three eight inch spaces, you'll get yourself some smaller spaces if needed for adjustment. So I'm sure you guys know what spaces are. You buy your spaces, they're reusable. That's gonna be used for your corners. It's gonna be used for your ends. The question has come up, well, why do you need an end brick if you have a corner brick? Well, if you come to a vertical control joint, you're gonna need an end brick because you can't caulk against foam, okay? Or if you have a flanged window, flanged window, you go right into the flange. If it's a recessed window, you're going with the corner. A lot of guys, what they do is if they know they're gonna be on a 4 8 12 they'll put one guy in a saw and they'll cut him right in half. They'll just lay him out. Now, the nice thing about this is you could actually cut this very, very easily. You don't need a diamond blade brick saw. You can cut it with a rotary saw, a handheld, right there on a scaffold, pull it up, make your cuts. Very, very simple. The product is two pounds per square foot as opposed to brick, which is 35 to 40 pounds per square foot. So you don't need pipe scaffolding. You could lay this product up on hung scaffolding. You could put it on scissor lifts. It's very, very easy. Anybody can lift this up. You got a cap unit over there. Obviously cap unit will be for an overhang or a cap, okay? That cap unit will also be used to soldier as a soldier course coming towards the end of the building where you might have your soldier, you come, make your return. Now, you see a 135 degree there. That's great, very typical, okay? We can make any angle you want. So although our standard shape is a 135, there are times you're gonna see a 120, you might see a 137, a 140, 150. And just so you guys know, I was in the brick industry for 30 years. So I kind of know how these shapes go, especially on a high rise. They're gonna request a lot of different things. Um, just like the brick industry, a shape is a shape, and that isn't a standard item, they have to be manufactured. 
Okay, so we had a kind of a formula to get everybody to figure out okay, how to come up with the square footage. It's easy math. You got 144 square inches in a foot. Okay, so what I basically had told people is if you take a three and five eighths by seven and five eighths brick, okay, basically you're going to take that calculation with the mortar joint. Three and five eighths is four, seven and five eighths is eight. So you have four and you have eight. Okay, what's eight times four? Come on, 32. Okay, you take 144, you divide it by that number. That's your square footage. That's the way you calculate what a brick is going to yield you. All right, so doing the math for you, and it's, we, we provide this anyway, a stretcher or a flat brick is going to be 6.85 brick per square foot. That is without waste. Okay? Uh, to have a corner brick, corner bricks are measured by linear foot. That's on your height. Okay, the, a lot of guys just figure 4.5. The true number is 4.57. Okay, you always have to allow for way. So, a lot of times, if you're estimating your brick, you might be saying, I'm using seven brick. You might be saying, I'm using five brick on the linear footage. Okay, Norman brick, okay, it's 4.57, 4.57. Okay, so it's linear footage 4.57, and it's 4.57 brick per square foot. Econo, 4.5, corner three, utility, three, three. That's your calculation. I'm going to tell you. Always calculate 5% for waste, okay? Depending on how kooky the job is and how much detail in the job is, you might get more waste, depending on what the architect is designing. Okay, estimating water and your joint options. With this particular product, it's one inch thick, one and one eighth inch thick. So you're gonna yield in an 80 pound bag, okay, pre-mixed mortar. Okay, 40. So if you have an 80 pound bag of pre-mixed mortar, okay, you're gonna get 40 square feet. If it was 90, you're gonna get 45. If it was 40, you're gonna get 20. It's real simple math, okay? Uh, take into consideration mortar eats up 20% of your wall, which people don't know. Okay, so really that's, that's a large percentage of what your wall is. You could add colored pigments. I don't like colored pigments. I never like colored pigments because quite honestly, depending on who's mixing it one day from another, it can, that color is a disaster. You just go out to any mason yard. You can buy pre-mixed colored mortar. Uh, we say you could use type S or type N. I'm an advocate of type S. All right, the reasoning is there's a, a question mark people have indicated that type N is more flexible. We're not looking for flexible, we're looking for flexural. Okay, type S is more flexural. There's a difference between the two. In addition, type S mortar shrinks less and it compacts better. So when you're mixing your mortar with our new brick latex additive, it increases the bond strength. You use type S, that decreases the shrinkage, it reduces the porosity, okay, and it makes the wall stronger. Okay, joint options. Because of that little lip that we were talking about, you cannot have a rake joint. You can't have a V joint. Okay, you're limited to a concave or a flush joint. Okay, we could put up there, and you probably can do a grapevine joint. That's something that they do a lot down south. I don't know if they do grapevines up here. I know on some residential jobs, you'll see a grapevine joint. You don't typically see it in New York. Okay. You see that guy on the right? That guy's carrying full-size brick. You don't have to worry about that because those brick are four pounds a pop, okay? Our brick, okay, are two pounds a square foot, okay? So think about that. That's 40 pounds a square foot versus what we are, okay? Two pounds a square foot, okay? So this is the key thing that you really want to look at here. This is everything you want to know. Okay, going back real fast, you know how to get your mortar, you know how to get your brick, okay, you know what sizes you got. Coming up over here, that's what you want to know. A typical crew is three men, okay? 
So one crew will yield when you get the hang of it. You probably, if you've never done this before, especially the tuck pointing, your production might be a little bit less. You're gonna get 200 square feet per eight hour days. That's a three man crew or roughly 66 square feet per man. The nice thing about this is that you don't need two mechanics on the wall. It is so easy to put this in a wall as long as you have one mechanic who lays out the wall, you could actually have two laborers, one mixing the mud, the other one following the mechanic. So let's make, let, we'll use imaginary numbers. If you're, and don't laugh, okay. If your mechanic is $50 an hour, okay. Typically on a masonry job, that's two fifties and one twenty-five. Okay, because you have two mechanics, 50, 50, 25 for the laborer. With us, you're 50, 25, 25. So your overall labor savings is increased because you don't need that skilled labor. You need that first guy to lay it out. Now, by the way, as, as I'm talking, Eric is actually doing the installation. Okay, and you know, you could... <laughs> so he laid it out and you're gonna see how he coursed it out afterwards. When I'm done, you can go up and ask him any questions you want. If anybody wants to get up and stick it in the wall, be our guest. Okay, you'll see how easy it is and how good that stuff sticks. Okay, uh, these production rates and hours are based on our Outsolation Plus um, MD system. Okay, so what does it include? If you're going over a typical EVES wall, okay, and this is what the difference is, okay, if you're going over an EVES wall, all right, typically when you end at your base coat, what are you putting over it? A finish, okay? You're just not putting a finish. What you're doing is you're adhering brick and you're tuck pointing it. The brick is actually, think of it as the finish. So you already know what your labor is up to that base coat. Okay? So this is based on applying the backstop, the aqua flash, the insulation, the brick tuck pointing and cleaning. That's everything included, that's your production. So typically people will ask me and they say, well stop, what if we're just going direct applied? Okay, so what, how much is that? It's approximately half. Because half your wall is up to that base coat in man hours, the other half is gluing the brick, tuck pointing and cleaning it. So if this was a direct applied project, your production on a direct applied would be 400 square feet a day. Okay, it's 200 when you're including the system. All right, basically materials required. You guys know all these materials. Okay, you could use Primus or Genesis. You could use it wet, you could use dry mix. Doesn't matter, one way or another, you could use it. Okay, we have our pre-mix. You're gonna get a pre-mix Type S mortar. You can mix it yourself. I'm highly suggesting you just get a nice quick Crete or a spec mix, pre-mixed, Type S. It's all screened, nothing to worry about. Just mix water in it. And really the way you're gonna mix it is you take a, Take a five gallon drum or a one gallon drum of our ad mixture. If you have an empty five gallon pail, put a one gallon in the pail, fill it with water, and then you mix it in your mud. Easiest way to do it, you can't mess it up, okay? Uh, so basically, obviously, you need your field brick, your corner brick, you need your end brick. Uh, if you need a shape of 135 degree, go to it, and if you need an edge cap, that's fine. As far as selection, we have 16 standard colors, okay? Uh, we can make custom colors. If anybody has ever seen our 288 brick catalog or color catalog, we can make any color there. We can match any color. Uh, we offer three different textures, wire cut, smooth, okay, and velour. We can blend, okay, and we can give you all sorts of effects. We can actually give you an iron spot it's not an actual iron spot, it's not actual iron, but it's a simulated iron spot where we put black fleck in it to look like an iron spot, all right? Um, as far as blending when, and being calculated, we don't blend, we can if you want us to. You really should blend yourself. It's a lot cheaper if you blend it than if we do, but I would definitely consider taking a look at the cost on both and you'll see blending in the field is gonna be less expensive, okay? Tools, I don't have to read them all out. I think you guys know what the tools are, okay? But that's your checklist. You just go through everything. Coursing, we got into coursing. 
So you want to establish that master row. Now what you see up here, this is right out of the BIA, okay, Brick Institute of America. They're working the walls on 48 inches, four feet, okay? And that's what you want to lay out. You want to lay out your lengths and your heights. You always want to start from the outside of a corner in. You don't want to start from in to out. Because if you have to make the cut on an internal return, you can make the cut and kill it. But if you start inside and you get to the end, you don't want to have that little piece at the end of your wall. So it's always suggested you lay out from the outside coming in. Okay. Do not assume the lowest common corner of the building is the best starting point. Okay. I've seen a lot of guys start laying this that never laid brick before. I have always, as a brick mason, taken it from the top of the windows down. Okay. Or from the floor lines down. Okay, because you want to have a true 8 inch, okay, or a true brick on the top of your window. Typically, windows all line up on their heights on a building. Okay, you'll see, well, hopefully, right, yeah, because sometimes they're all up by a few inches um, or a few, whatever. But to make a long story short, if you, if you stop at the sill and then you go to the height of the window, you're going to have a problem. So if you take it from the window height down, Always remember one thing, you're going to have a sill or a row lock. And that's where you're going to make your cut or you're going to hide if you're off a little bit. All right? And that's basically what you weren't here when he was laying the project out, but Eric laid this all out and he is dead bolts on. Okay? I mean, he will just run that up. He'll take his uh, level every now and then. He'll measure every two feet just to make sure he's cost. He'll add shims as, as he needs them. Okay? And you'll see that wall is going to come out absolutely perfect. So again, guys, lay out your job, figure out your windows. Door heights don't typically line up with window heights, but window heights are pretty true on a project. Okay, you'll always see that the bottom of the windows will be altered, okay, but you don't really see that the heights of the windows. Okay? Um, make sure you locate your head joints, so on and so forth. Okay, you can get jack arches. Okay, you can get circular arches. What we've done here is we've teamed up with Acrocore. Acrocore um, does our drive a shape pro program for us. They'll be coming on after me. Uh, I thought it would be really neat because they do jack arches for us. Uh, they do sills. They do all sorts of shapes for us. And I thought it would be great to do this presentation showing you a jack arch. You could put a keystone in there. You could have a sill. You could use a row lock if you want without brick. But typically in a residential job, you're going to see that you're going to have some type of cast on. So by driver teaming up with Acrocore and manufacturing these shapes, if you go to a masonry job, you're going to see cast on or limestone as your accent banding. Okay? You can do that with us. So there would be a conventional brick with limestone or cast stone. Well, we needed to answer that. So with Acrocore, we answered that. So now your entire wall is an eaves and a foam wall. And it's one manufacturer, single source. All right? Now, what you're looking at Eric doing right now, when you're applying the adhesive, you want to be vertical. That trowel should be on a 45. OK? You can, doesn't matter if you go from the bottom up or you go top down. Okay, but the brick actually drain behind the brick, in front of the foam, and behind the foam. So unlike our EVES systems where it drains behind the foam, this actually offers drainage in both the front and the back. Chances of water getting behind the foam are very, very slim. Okay, so you're draining from two different locations. Uh, the reason why you don't want to go across, because you don't want to trap water. So any type of residual moisture that might get in that wool, if you notch trowel left and right, you will get some effects. If free store, you might lose a couple of brick. Okay? Um, you could actually do a, a ribbon, which you just dab two ends of the brick, but we don't recommend that. Now, a lot of guys in the brick industry that's done thin brick, they put two dabs at the end of the brick and they stick it in the wall. We still prefer that you do it our method. Okay, so again, blending. When you're blending your brick, you're gonna get boxes. These, actually, we eliminated the box, we now have straps. So they're gonna come in straps of brick in a bundle, 
okay? We want you to work for multiple bundles. If this was a conventional brick, you'd be working from two or three pallets, and you'd be coming downward on it. Well, we kind of want you to work for multiple boxes, okay? Because remember, it's a manufactured product, so depending on how it's being extruded and how much finish is actually going on the unit itself, although very accurate, you can have a little bit of inconsistency, so we do want you to work from multiple boxes. In addition, if you're blending your brick, when you order your brick, you just give us the percentages. We'll make sure it's shipped with the blend that you want. Lay it out, take a look at the wall, make sure your blend is proper. Just do it the right way the first time and you'll never have a problem. We already got into the fact that the corner brick and the end brick do not include the spacing lip. Um, we are looking into a different method of a corner brick right now where we actually miter it and then finish it using foam to foam. If that should happen, there will be the spacer on the return. But for now, you're using spaces as you see Eric doing. All right, setting the brick, guys. There you go. Nice and easy. Now, the one thing is, in your heights, as you're measuring off, you might dip a little bit in spaces depending on how the wall is going. Again, you could use those smaller spaces just to bring yourself up a little bit, all right? But as far as horizontally, if you're running off, there's two things you can do, okay? What is acceptable by ASTM standard is your mortar joint cannot be less than a quarter inch and cannot be any wider than a half inch. What does that mean? If you're running off, okay, or you're getting too tight, you could either tighten the mortar joint or you could open up the mortar joint. That is always favorable. If that's not going to work, you could always cut the brick. My suggestion is that if you have a long wall and you're running off, don't put the cut at the end. Put the cut all the way up the middle. So let's say you were off by an inch and you needed to make that one inch cut. If you hide it in the middle and be consistent all the way up the wall, okay, you're not going to pick it up. If you're losing something in your height, the nice thing, we, we, we were just talking about window heights. Carpenter goes in there, that thing is supposed to be plumb straight across, but that window and that window are off by a quarter inch. That's why architects love soldier courses, because you could lose it in a soldier, okay? Or you could lose it in your cast stone, or in that particular place, your arch. What you do is you just cut it. Just cut it. Just cut the hip because it's 8 inch, 10 inch, or 12 inch on those type of heights. So if you're losing 3 eighths of an inch, you're not going to put a sliver of a brick in there, especially if it's 2 and a quarter inch. What you'll do is you'll take it out of the soldier. You won't pick it up. Yeah. All right, so tuck pointing. All right, so what you want to do is when you're ready to tuck point or apply your mortar, the day after, 12, typically 12 hours to 24 hours, so really it's the next day, you want to make sure that wall is dry, you want all the moisture to get out, and then you want to tuck point. So you really shouldn't be tuck pointing the same day. You want to tuck point approximately 24 hours, okay? Um, Mix the borders described in section three of our application guide. We pretty much went through that. You want to use a number five tip, okay? Uh, what you do want to do is, you, uh, right there, you want to do your horizontal joints first, and then you do your head joints second, okay? Because if you're doing your head joints first and then second, you're going to pull the mortar out. So always do your horizontal joints first. Uh, you want to make sure you overfill the mortar joint. You don't want to be scared that the mortar is too thick. Because remember one thing, when you're striking the joint, you're compressing the mortar. You want to compress the mortar. All right? If for any reason that mortar is too wet and it starts dripping, let it drip, back off, wait until you get the right consistency, go back. Never, ever, ever try to clean the mortar on that brick. Just clean it at the end of the job. Okay, because you're going to smudge it. Just let it go. It looks horrible. Just let it go and continue on. Okay. Uh, what is the consistency? They say like a milkshake. Okay. Uh, I say like wet beach sand. 
just where you're not getting water coming out of it. it. It's almost to a point where it's almost dry, but it's still pliable, where you can strike it. Uh, typically, in a few hours, you could actually brush off the excess water. You don't want it to get too dry because you're not going to be able to. If you strike it too soon and it's too wet, you're going to get a streak, you're going to get shiny. Okay? If it's too wet, you're going to burn the joint. So again, this takes technique. This is the thing here that you guys really need to know. The hardest part about this is the tuck pointing. Make sure you've got a good guy on the, on the line that's going to be able to tuck point and grout properly. And, and that is the perfect way right there. See what that guy's, look how overfilled that is. And if that is of the same, of the right consistency, it's not going to drip. He's just going to wait. He's just going to go up there and he's going to touch it with his finger. He'll know. And by the way, it takes your guy one time to screw up, he'll never do it again. All right, uh, here we go. Prior striking joints, okay. Make sure the consistency of the motor is correct. I, I could read it to you. Rake joints, before remember I told you the joints, never use a rake joint. I wouldn't use a rake joint regardless. Okay, it traps water and allows water to penetrate. Okay, cleaning and brushing. So, if you're doing a real clean job and you strike that, that, that particular job happens to be in Brooklyn. That wasn't cleaned. The guy just happened to do a real good job. Okay, and you can still see a little bit of mortar around the edges. If that owner wanted to, he can go back and clean it. Okay, but typically, if, you know, once they get the hang of it, they probably don't have to clean it. So, if you've got a good guy tuck pointing, you're not going to have to clean the wall. In your labor, you're going to figure you're going to clean. If the guy's so good, you're going to save yourself a few hours. All right, now this is very, very key. Uh, you cannot use muriatic acid. In fact, you really shouldn't be using muriatic acid on conventional masonry, especially with all the manganese that's in brick today. Okay, so basically you want to use Sure Clean 600. You want to use Vanitrol. Okay, you want to use Dietrich. I'm just giving you a few companies. Okay, Dietrich makes two products. 101 is like the Sure Clean 600. Their 102 is like uh, Vanitrol. I like Vanitrol. Vanitrol is a lighter detergent. Okay, it doesn't burn. I just think it's the best product. Even, even in my brick days, I always recommend a Vanitrol or Dietrich 102. And it doesn't have to be these manufacturers. Okay, if you want to use another manufacturer, it's fine as long as it's comparable to these products. Now, conventional masonry says you really shouldn't be cleaning that wall until that brick gets hard, or the mortar gets hard, excuse me. So typically, you want to start cleaning that brick after 14 days, not to exceed 28 days, because once that mortar gets hard, you're not going to get it off the brick. All right. You're adding a latex additive to this. That's an accelerator. All right, so you best be sure when you're cleaning this, you want to clean this product because of the latex additive in seven to 10 days, not to exceed 14 days. You go over that 14 days, you're going to have a heck of a time trying to get that mortar off that wall. Uh, 10 to 1, and it all depends on the manufacturer. But typically, it's 10 to 1. Okay. All right, so what are the benefits of new brick? Now, this is where the cost savings is, which is huge. When you bid this out, what's going to wind up happening is you're going to see versa brick job, there's minimal to no savings. So a lot of times, what's going to happen is an owner's going to say, well, I get $30 a square foot for brick. You guys are $30 a square foot. There's no savings of going back to brick. Not at all. The savings isn't in the new brick and the installation of new brick. The savings is in the composite wall. When you eliminate the hung lintels and the relieving angles, when you take your steel studs from 14 to 18 gauge, your composite wall savings to that owner is 25 to 30 percent. Forget about the thin brick system to the full brick system. It's going to be a push. You're probably going to save a few bucks, but you're not even going to say it. That's where your savings is going to be. Okay, so we just addressed a few things there. You're eliminating hung lintels, relieving angles. 
You can go from a 14 gauge steel stud masonry, could probably go to a 16. You can go with an 18 to a 20 gauge steel stud because there's no weight on this. It's nothing, all right? We've already talked about the composite wall savings. That is, that's the sell point. The product offers continuous insulation. So whereas brick needs to have a cavity and has to have the insulation within the wall, all right, you have to accommodate that steel lintel and that relieving angle. So if a brick is four inches and it has to have CI and it has to have a two inch foam to meet the requirement, okay, we're in zone four, so you need two inches, okay? That brick being four with the one inch cavity is five plus the two inches, five, six, seven, that's seven inches of steel that has to carry the weight of that brick, okay? There's no steel needed. That wall is two inches plus the brick, which is one inch, that's a three inch wall. Your footings shrink, you're saving money on the footings, okay? The product meets all energy codes, it meets the NFPA 285, um, we offer two different types of systems, which we discussed before, the Oscillation X system, okay, or the OPMD system. Uh, you're getting an R3.85 on our regular OPMD system. If you want to use the blue board, which is the cavity mate, okay, that's an R5 for one inch. Now, right now, Mark and I have been working on a few really, really nice jobs in New York and in Connecticut. It seems that passive house is the big thing in the New York metropolitan area. These are high energy walls. I could rattle off a half a dozen, okay, developers and contractors that are using new brick because they do not want to use the steel within the wall. They just want to use a continuous wall of insulation. The new brick gives them that. They're not having any steel in the wall, it's saving them a fortune. Okay. The other problem with, um, with passive houses is they don't want to lose energy. It's not just uh, the savings of the money. Um, they're very conscientious about saving energy. So what happens is when you have that steel lintel, okay, they're getting dermal bridging. They're losing energy. They don't want to lose any. They want to use and save as much energy as possible. So with a continuous insulated wall, there's no energy loss. There's no steel. The wall is lighter. Lucky for us, we came up with this before passive house because now all of a sudden they just love it. So when you, when you see these passive houses, okay, you should jump all over it. When you see projects that have combination of brick and eaves, you should be trying to change them. You're gonna save that money to the owner. That's it, that's my presentation. Do we have any questions? I got off easy. <laughs> If you guys want to just get up uh, before Scott Bella comes up right after me, it's going to be Scott. But I would suggest everybody just get up and just take a peek if you can, what Eric is doing. He's actually putting a cylinder right now. Thank you very much.